I'm from Colorado, and I make inflatable sculpture. So the sculpture I make is fabric that's sewn together and then inflates with forced air, so similar to like a jumping castle kind of. Um, it's all sewn on the sewing machine. I draft my patterns by hand on paper. Um, my work in general is inspired by relationships I find in nature, which is why I'm really excited to be here. A lot of times I spend a lot of time on the internet researching like what microscopic things look like and different interesting science perspectives. And so I'm really excited to be here and get to hear things from you all about what you're excited about, what you think looks cool, and what I might be inspired by. So a lot of my work, I'll just kind of go through and talk about it. Um, some of my work is wearable inflatables, so they're actually inflatables that I wear. This one is inflating out of a backpack, so it has like a battery and fans inside of the backpack. It's called distended defense because it's inspired by diametic behavior, so like the behavior where prey is tricking the predator. So when the predator could easily, you know, eat a moth, but it has big eye spots, so that instead the predator thinks it's bigger than it is, or a caterpillar that looks like it has two heads, so it's like you don't know for sure if you're sneaking up on it or not. So my inflatable similarly has this sort of feeling of like two heads. It also has tons of spikes. It's really big, but in reality, it's all just air and fabric. So the idea is that it looks like I may be protected by this giant inflatable around me, but in reality, it's just fabric and um, not actually protective at all. Um, I'm also, I did a residency near Joshua Tree, and I'm really inspired by different kinds of relationships, like I said, and the Yucca Moths and the Joshua Tree have an important relationship, which is an obligate mutualist relationship, meaning they can't survive without one another, because um, the Yucca Moth is a specific moth that pollinates the Joshua Tree. No other insect can pollinate it, based on its, like, very specific mouth parts that it has, and the, um, the moth, yucca moth, in turn, can only lay its eggs in the Joshua tree. So without each other, they can't continue. And as the climate is changing, their overlapping terrain is getting smaller and smaller. So when I was there, I made a wearable yucca moth and an inflatable Joshua tree. But my Joshua tree is a fallen Joshua tree. And so I did a pollination performance where my yucca moth is trying to pollinate the dead Joshua tree to talk about this relationship they have. So the, the little orange stuff balls represent the pollen, and I had like a, some Velcro on my head, which was under the moss head, so I could collect the pollen on my head and move it around. Um, right, I did that project right before COVID happened and shutdowns started, and when the shutdown started, I did a project. I was supposed to go to do a performance piece with some of my pieces, and I couldn't do it, so I made a virtual exhibit. Um, and in this, <laughs> but I took my wearables and um, I put them inside of a giant inflatable space that I built and filmed them. And there were these very long films of these creatures that were taken out of their natural habitat. So I had the photographs of them out in nature, and then these videos of them in these weird white spaces. And they were like this long video just of these creatures existing in this weird sterile space. And I was thinking about, you know, in the future as things can't exist naturally out in the environment, how things are going into the lab and think like, what if the Joshua tree and the Yucca Moth could only exist in a lab where they can be together in the right circumstances doing like pollination. So it's like watching these creatures, like having to live in these strange situations because of what's happening to the planet. You can see them. These are just like these long videos that it would look like you're maybe you know, looking in through a little portal at what's happening in there. And it's all in so like all the space and all the pieces. This is a piece I made recently in the same kind of sci-fi futuristic idea of how we're going to adapt to changes. Um, this is a biophilic regeneration series. And this was a project I worked on with a farmer in Colorado who's doing a lot of interesting work with soil regeneration and adding microbes into the soil and rejuvenating the soil. 
So this project is all about this like imagined contraption that can rejuvenate soil. So you would go and deploy it in an area where the land has been destroyed and it would put microbes out into the soil. And this is it in the gallery. And when you like walk up and interact with it, the whole piece like shakes. It's on a motion detector and this golden ball that's covered in these kind of microbial worms rises out of it. And then more recently, my partner Devin and I have been traveling around and creating work together. And a lot of times we make things based on what we find and see. We found this weird um, kind of parchment tube on the beach. And as we researched it, we learned about this parchment tube worm that lives inside the tube. And so it was visually really stunning. And we needed to make a big um, puppet. So this is actually a puppet. So it has three sticks so you can walk around with it. Um, and then just recently at the last residency we're in, we made a sea cucumber, because our first day there, I went and visited some tidal pools, and the there was a naturalist there that talked to us about sea cucumber evisceration, and I thought that it would be really cool to try to create a wearable where I could have the cucumber eviscerate. So this is very not scientific, because these creatures would never be together, <laughs> but the, the worm is scaring the cucumber, so did it will through a few projects really quickly because I know I'm spending a little too much time and I want you to get an idea of some of the things I'm interested in. This is concerning plants and it's about plant communications um, and I wanted to create a kind of whimsical diagram of what I imagined happening under the soil in the forest when the plants you know are communicating through mycelial networks or through different kinds of pheromones. And so when you go through the forest, you see these strange kind of rhizome-like root systems popping up out of the ground. Um, the incubation effect was a piece I did based on like larval transformation. And people could see all these like little cute stuffed larvae and imagine what they were gonna become. So there was like an interactive component where people would make drawings of what they imagined the larva might turn into. And then I made new sculptures based on the drawings that people made. So it's sort of like um, how they were able to impact the envi environment by how they felt about different things. Um, and then I really love, like I said, different microscopic organisms. I did a project inspired by uh, different kinds of algae, specifically dinoflagellates, if I'm saying it right. Um, this piece is called Out of the Bloom, and it was made for the Denver Zoo for their gift shop. And I wanted to talk about this idea that these tiny microscopic things have a lot of power because when they come together, they can create these blooms that cause a lot of either destruction or, you know, in the cause of a bioluminescent event, something humans find really beautiful. But when they come together, even though they're so tiny, they can have a giant impact on the environment. So being at a zoo that's talking about conservation, the idea that our lavar, things that we do, have a bigger impact than we imagine. So here you can see where I'm like looking at the microscopic imagery and translating it into an inflatable form. There's also some green algae in there. And then uh, rotifers are some of my favorite. Um, I really love looking at like old illustrations that were made when like they first were using microscopes to see these really kind of artistic, beautiful illustrations of these different creatures. And I did a project with this. I've done a multiple projects with rotifers because there's so many different ones and they all look really interesting. Um, but I did one project at the Amsterdam Light Festival, so they were all gluing. And then I did one at a children's museum where I showed the kids all the pictures of the rotifers and they made drawings. And then based on their drawings, I made the, the inflatables. So you can see on one side is the Children's Museum and one side is the Light Festival. This is Outbreak, so it's inspired by bacteria and virus imagery. And 
I did this way before COVID, and my concept at the time was that, again, we're surrounded by all these tiny things that we don't actually think about that much, but now it's very different because everyone is now always thinking since COVID about the tiny things around us, so it's, it feels very different. Um, but I looked at some stomach bacteria like H. pylori and um, smallpox is in there and just some various bits and pieces of other microscopic things. Um, powdery mildew, I really love different kinds of fungus and mushrooms. I did a whole project looking at different microscopic fungus because they have such cool forms. This is a powdery mildew, which is, you know, if you have a garden, you always get powder, powdery mildew on your zucchinis or, you know, different plants. But they look really cool, kind of like these exploded Pac-Men. So um, all of these, I was looking at these different kinds of parasitic funguses. Um, these are the apple scabs. You can see how I kind of look at the apple scab and transform it into an inflatable mold. Again, very beautiful under the microscope. And then, I don't know if they're here, but I talked to someone about how I do kids, class with kids, where I combine science and art, and they had mentioned being interested in this petri dish workshop I do. So sometimes I'll either, I'll show kids these different microscopic images and have them um, make either their own little petri dishes where they sculpt them out of Sculpey and then they like paint the background, or I imagine, that, have them imagine they're looking through a microscope and what it would look like and then use something like a paper plate and they make like a fabric collage background with these little sculptures. And it's a really fun way to like combine art and science in like a kid's class. So I put that in just because someone had asked me about that the other day. But I know that was, I went really fast because <laughs> I know there's not a ton of time, but does anyone have any questions? Yeah? What kind of material do you use? So most of these earlier ones are made out of nylon with like a plastic coating. So it's, and it's, um, keeps the air in, but then the seams are always leaking a little bit. And then the ones I've been doing more recently, like the, this is like a ripstop with like a silicone that's impregnating it, so it's super lightweight. These have just these like tiny fans that are blowing them up that you can kind of just put the battery in your pocket. So you don't need um, as much power to inflate this fabric. Yeah. Um, I was just going to remind, I'm reminded of, uh, of an event I ran a meeting for the Association for Science of Luminology and Oceanography in Santa Fe a number of years ago. We had a plankton art collaboration there where we had a juried exhibition of people who were making art inspired by plankton. And the other theme that was taking place there was a lecture on the influence of Ernst Haeckel yeah. on, um, well, his art and illustrations of marine fauna and such, but also its influence on art deco and architecture. So I don't know if you've ever intersected with that Ernst Haeckel's influence or. Yeah, actually uh, I have multiple Heckle I, in the, this the plates look very familiar. Yeah, so from this is a heckle of the dinoflagellates. Often when I actually, I do a mixture of looking for microscopic imagery and heckle's imagery because I think he does like, it's like helpful to translate into an inflatable to see the way he's drawn it. Because it's like sort of that in between state between, you know, the science to the art. And like, so heckle I think is really amazing for me specifically. The other thing I wanted to comment on was the motion of your pieces, which are really interesting, sort of add a different sort of dimension to it. Um, motion in small scale, a microscopic scale involves um, a whole Reynolds number, where mm -hmm. viscosity dominates rather than inertia. I don't know if you know about low Reynolds number Not physics. <laughs> you might want to look into it, and whenever you look under a microscope, you can observe it happening. It's, okay. it's as if we were in a fluid of slightly cold molasses mm -hmm. to simulate that experience. And so, for example, when a daphnia moves its appendage like this in the water, particles over here will move. Oh. They will move like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> 
And that's because the stickiness of the water molecules is dominated um, and everything is sort of sticky to each other. Mm -hmm. And it's a very strange world that's very alien for those of us, the large things like us who exist in a high rails number environment. So I encourage you to Google that up and then when you're looking for a microscope, try to observe the way the small particles move when you're looking at them. It's very strange. Yeah, definitely. And I definitely, I want to get with different people to look through microscopes as much as possible to see things, you know, actually. And maybe your sculptures might be able to capture that effect yeah. somehow, even though they're operating in high realms. Yeah, no, it's interesting because I think, especially the sea cucumber, we was working really hard to, like, get it to move in this kind of, like, slow, rhythmic way. But I do feel like that, I wasn't even thinking about it. It's like the way things move in water. Um, when I, a lot of my earlier work, I was doing all white because um, mostly it was like just figuring out pattern making was really complicated when I first started. So adding in color was like a whole other major thing. But I also really like the like white. When you have like a whole white installation, it feels very surreal and otherworldly and expansive. So it feels like bigger, weird expanse. So I like the all white. Originally, it was like partially just like to figure out patterning, but now I still go back and make all white installations because I like the feel a lot. Yeah. All right, thank you.